The topic of today's video is USS Gambier Bay, one of the many, many, many escort carriers built by the USN in World War II. Probably doomed to obscurity, like her sisters and cousins, had events not intervened. Some ships are remembered for their lucky breaks, such as Prince Eugen. Some are remembered for their long and courageous service, like Enterprise. Gambier Bay had neither luck nor long service. Her career was a short one that ended off the coast of Samar, fighting to the last. Her name is remembered for her death. She has no great achievements. She has no miraculous victories. What Gambier Bay has is a dogged determination and fighting until she couldn't fight anymore. When she was laid down by the Kaiser shipyards on July 10th, 1943, none of this could have been predicted. Gambier Bay was special only in that she was a bonus ship for the yard personnel who built her. Kaiser had intended to build 16 escort carriers in 1943. Because these shipyards were overachievers, though, they pushed to 18 when the Navy asked, Can you please add two more? Kaiser's response to that was to make a campaign suitably named 18 or more by 44 to meet or exceed the Navy's new requirement. And exceed they did. Gambier Bay would be the 19th and last carrier commissioned in 1943 from the Kaiser Yards, the bonus ship. Launched on November 22, 1943, and commissioned on December 28th, barely meeting the goal admittedly, she immediately set off for the Pacific. A short shakedown crew saw her set off from San Diego to Pearl Harbor on February 7th, 1944, with some 400 troops for the harbor. Whereupon, she then went out towards the Marshall Islands, fulfilling one of the traditional escort carrier roles. Transporting replacement planes to better equipped carriers and land bases. In this case, she flew off 84 replacements to Enterprise and shore bases. It was only when this was done, and after a brief April training cruise, that she received her own planes. These would have consisted of roughly two dozen, exact numbers fluctuate, planes, generally a mix of Wildcats and Avengers. The Avengers were about the biggest planes such a ship could reliably manage, and that's why Gambier Bay and other escort carriers were flinging around Wildcats in 1944 when such planes were running up on obsolete in the face of Hellcats and Corsairs. Regardless, with her planes aboard, Gambier Bay was assigned to Carrier Support Group 2 for the invasion of the Marianas. In this, she joined a massive fleet with quite a few carriers in support. It should come as little surprise, then, that Gambier Bay did relatively little work here herself. Not that she did nothing at all. Far from it. However, as should be clear from her ship type, her missions mostly revolved around ground support. Her planes flew along with no fewer than 11 other escort carriers to support the initial landings on Saipan on June 15th. They strafed and bombed Japanese positions, wrecking tanks, trucks, and anything else they happened to see. This is good work, but also the utilitarian kind of work that doesn't exactly get people jumping to make documentaries about you. Her pilots did prove to be shockingly lucky, though, in that multiple times they got shot down or otherwise crashed, just to be picked up in short order. Through the course of the early battle, her fighters would support the other escorts in shooting down or forcing off at least 47 planes. Gambier Bay's own gunners shot down two out of the three that managed to get close enough to attack her. However, during the harsher attacks on June 19th, we have the Marianas Turkey Shoot. Gambier Bay would participate, though by no means was she alone here. Her fighters joined with other American carriers to absolutely slaughter the Japanese attackers. The Turkey Shoot is called such for a good reason, and is largely what finally crippled Japanese naval aviation for the rest of the war. At least as a traditional striking force. For her part, Gambier Bay would get rather lucky here in that no fewer than three bombs came very close to hitting her. Two off her port side and another off her starboard side. 
and yet she took no actual damage. With that excitement done and over with, though, Gambier Bay returned to more mundane duty. She would support the landings on Peleliu in September, and then join up with the invasion force for the Philippines later in the month. These initial operations went much the same as those off Saipan. Her planes would support the ground forces, while the attacks on bigger targets went to the bigger carriers. In this case, the attacks on the Japanese fleet. Those are a topic for another video, but for now, keep in mind that for all intents and purposes, it looked like the Japanese had pulled back after the big fleet carriers sank Musashi and damaged other ships of the center force. No one was expecting the Japanese to turn around after making a false retreat. No one predicted that, as Gambier Bay sailed with the rest of her task force, Taffy 3, that they would be thrust into combat they weren't intended for. Yet, that is what happened. Six escort carriers with three destroyers and four destroyer escorts would soon be facing the strongest naval force left to Japan, alone. When the Japanese sailed into sight on the morning of October 25th, 1944, the shocked Americans had no idea of what was coming. However, knowing how terribly outgunned they were, the Americans immediately turned and beat a hasty retreat. Taffy 3 flung what planes they had into the air, often armed with depth charges and small bombs, some with only the bullets and their machine guns. These brave pilots would still harass the Japanese ships, while Taffy 3 made smoke and attempted to withdraw. This was no easy task. Gambier Bay herself can make maybe 20 knots if she really pushed her engines to the breaking point. The slowest Japanese battleship, Nagato, could make 25 to 26. While smoke screens were put up, the American destroyers and destroyer escorts made brave charges at the Japanese. These would ultimately see two destroyers and one escort sunk. Gambier Bay, meanwhile, trailed the American formation. Her single 5-inch gun fired back at the Japanese, something done more out of raw anger and frustration than to do any real damage. It was striking back at an enemy that was rapidly hauling up on the carriers, with their far larger guns trained on the lightly armored flat tops. Our hero here would soon be hit by multiple different ships. The arguably fatal hit, though, came at 8.20 that morning. A shell fired by one of the Japanese ships slammed into her engine room, cutting her speed by half as the forward room flooded. The source of this shell is something debated to this day. The American accounts of the time held it to be an 8-inch shell, probably from the cruiser Chikuma. The Japanese, meanwhile, couldn't decide between Yamato and Congo. Both claimed hits on an aircraft carrier at this time. The actual source of the shot doesn't really matter, though. Either an 18-inch or 14-inch shell would make mincemeat of a lightly armored escort carrier. For what it's worth, general consensus seems to have settled on Yamato, as she had the better angle and shorter range. Regardless, with her already sluggish speed cut in half, Gambier Bay was doomed at this point. The cruisers Tone and Chikuma closed to point-blank range, as the picture on screen shows. These ships opened fire with all their guns, and the battered Gambier Bay soon succumbed to the hailstorm of fire. By 9.07, she had capsized, and a few minutes later, nothing was left. In the end, nearly 800 men would be fished out of the water. 147 would die, be it to the actual battle, or shark attacks and other hazards of drifting in oil-soaked water. Gambier Bay would, from this, gain the unfortunate distinction of being the only American aircraft carrier sunk by purely surface gunfire during the war. She did not go down without a fight, though. Perhaps the greatest indicator of the spirit of Gambier Bay comes from what her first captain told his men before sailing for the Marianas and her first combat operation. We are working hard, and we are making progress. That is evident from increased efficiency of lookouts, reduced time for manning general quarter stations, more accurate shooting, fewer engine casualties while steaming, and a hundred other small items. I am pleased with the wholehearted cooperation of the officers and crew, but I am not satisfied. By that statement, I mean that I shall not be satisfied until this ship is ready for battle in every respect. That even the best efforts of every man are not enough until each of us can say yes 
to these two questions. 1. Am I ready for battle? 2. Is the Gambier Bay ready for battle? When that day comes, we can consider our immediate task accomplished. Until it comes, I shall drive relentlessly toward our goal, and I know that I can count on each and every one of you. Remember that it is not enough to do what you are told. Good intentions excuse only children and fools when the chips are down and battle is joined. It is the results that count. As of when this video is uploaded, her wreck has not been found. The most recent search of these deep waters, done explicitly to find her, would instead find the wreck of Samuel B. Roberts. We can only hope that a follow-on expedition does, eventually, find the final resting place of a brave ship. For those who stuck around to the end, thank you, and I hope you enjoyed the surprise video upload. You'll note I don't normally post on Sundays. This video was pushed up a bit because of Sydney, rather face planning for some reason I can't fathom in comparison to previous Saturday videos. So I pushed this one up. We'll return to regularly scheduled Tuesday uploads with a more general look at escort carriers as a whole. I hope to see you all there.